Chapter 6, What Window Cleaner is For Franklin, Helena, and William walked through the main lobby of Vlactermat toward the elevator. Franklin would have preferred the element of surprise, but Vlactermat, being a center of mental health for beings all over the multiverse and holding secrets that would compromise the mental health of most humans, had an extremely complex and effective security system. Breaking into the building would have been impossible. Franklin had missed Flactermat more than he realized. He felt comforted by the familiar smell of coffee and donuts, the various interdimensional beings, doctors and patients, who walked through the lobby to their appointments, and the poster on the wall that read, Insanity is Relative. He had already worked in the regular world for too long. That world ignored the strange things that happened every day and quibbled and bickered about its politics and its television and its carbohydrates and its other such things that didn't make a pebble of difference in the grand beach that was the multiverse. Working in that world again had made him feel like a fish in a bowl. He knew there was a world outside of the bowl, but the fake plants and sunken pirate ship tried to make him forget about it. Before they reached the elevator, a spiny-tailed Vaclock bee stepped in front of them. It was seven feet tall and slightly resembled an armadillo. It had a gray outer shell and rough fur. The three of them stopped in their tracks, and Helena instantly stood in a fighting stance ready to defend them. "'Have you been, Tramsey?' asked Franklin, holding out his hand. Helena looked at him and eased her stance. "'Pretty good.' The Vaclock responded in a deep growl. His English was barely understandable, though he was perfectly fluent, and Franklin figured the others probably couldn't make it out. He only knew what Tramsey was saying because he had gotten used to the accent when Tramsey had been his patient, which meant that Tramsey was potentially under Grothman's influence. Still going to your PEA meetings? Franklin asked the Vaclock. PEA? asked Helena. People Eaters Anonymous, William whispered. Every week, said Tramsey, and I'm still clean, too. The cravings are getting worse, though. Dr. Grothman gave me a great suggestion about alleviating them. Franklin took a deep breath. He knew what was coming. What's that? I'm going to go kill myself. In fact, I'm on my way to do that right now. Uh, you guys can join me if you want. No, thanks. I think we have something that might help you even more. Tramsey shook his massive head. No way. Dr. Grothman said there's nothing more effective. Franklin turned to Helena and William, who were standing on either side of him. This was the time to test their plan. Fire. The three of them raised their bottles of bright blue window cleaner and squirted the vac lock, each emptying half a bottle. Tramsey stared at them, confused. He was entirely unaffected. Was I dirty? he asked. He wiped off some of the cleaner that was dripping down the front of his shell. Well, thanks, I guess. Wouldn't want to go take the big plunge without going through the wash first. Ciao. He waved at them, turned around, and walked away. I don't understand, William said. That should have worked. There are only two possibilities, said Franklin. Either window cleaner doesn't work on vac locks, or we bought the wrong brand, asked William. Franklin pulled out the Nitsu Trivis knot and thumbed through it again. Or this cheap English translation has a typo. Wait a minute, said William. You used an English copy of an interdimensional reference guide written in Brawlnack? Franklin had only grabbed the book because of its contents. He had completely forgotten which language it was written in. Brawlnack was one of the most difficult interdimensional languages in existence. There were a hundred ways to say the same word depending on the context. Sometimes vowels and consonants even switched places depending on context. If his copy had been translated wrong, there was no way to tell where the mistake was. Helena did not look happy. Are you saying we may have brought the window cleaner for no reason? He's saying that we might have needed a box of Cracker Jacks for all we know, said William. Okay, look, don't panic, said Franklin. I just read the book. It was the best reference we had. I doubt Lyra has anything in the original Brawlnack. That's because it's so frustrating that most of the copies got burned or eaten, said William. I wish I hadn't been drunk last night now. Maybe I would have noticed what you guys were reading, and we could have avoided this whole getting us all killed thing. Franklin ignored him and looked at the section in the Nitsu Trivistan about Threpnoidians. He read it over again carefully and found nothing new. I didn't read it wrong. It says to use window cleaner. We did that. 
Maybe there's another step, Helena said. Shake well, Franklin read. Not helping, said William. We've got to do something. The Vaclock is on his way to off himself as we speak. Not that I'm a big fan of the Vaclocks or anything, but he has been going to rehab and all. The floor began to quiver slightly beneath them, and Franklin was positive that it was because of the man wearing the giant, shiny red robot suit walking toward them. Greetings, said the man in the robot suit. It was at least seven feet tall and covered Grothman's body from head to toe, probably to protect him from precisely what Franklin was planning. Behind the vaguely tinted glass of the robot's domed head, Franklin could make out three small black horns protruding out of Grothman's threatenoidian forehead. His skin was cranberry red, and his hair was long and black. He stopped a few feet from the three of them, and one of his robot feet made a slight indention into the floor as he slammed it down. His head made a high-pitched whine as it looked down at each of them. "'I would have been here earlier, but I just found out you were here,' Grothman said through a loudspeaker built into the robot suit's head. "'And you've brought window cleaner!' Its giant arms folded in front of it. "'Impressive!' So it wasn't the window cleaner that Nitsu Trivisnot was wrong about, it was how they were using it. How did you know we were here? Franklin asked him. Your patients aren't the only people under my persuasion. Dr. Kaslam told me you wouldn't be especially happy if you discovered that someone using my therapeutic techniques had obtained your old position. So I've had people watching in case you returned. Grothman in his massive armored suit lumbered closer and loomed over them menacingly. Some people have no respect for new and innovative ways of doing things. Why are you doing this? Franklin asked as he looked around for some way to gain the upper hand. Everyone in the lobby continued to go about their business as though nothing unusual was happening. It seemed that Grothman's influence stretched to everyone in Vlactermat by now. It was a good thing William had figured him out when he had, but now that Grothman's suit had them pinned against a wall with nowhere to run, and now that the one plan they had was useless... There wasn't much left they could do about it. Your patients are hopeless, Dr. Bryce, as most are. Grothman smiled deviously. Many of them allow themselves to fall into a vulnerable and unstable mindset, incapable of social functions, and are therefore worthless to society. That kind of self-defeating way of thinking is intolerable, and there is only one way to remedy it. You're right, Dr. Grothman. "'William said sarcastically. "'Survival of the fittest. "'That is a brand new idea. "'Wish I'd thought of it.' "'I don't see any point in debating with you,' "'said Dr. Grothman. "'After all, there's really only one way to sway you.' "'Grothman closed his eyes for a moment. "'You agree with me now, don't you?' "'It all suddenly made perfect sense to Franklin. "'His patients were weak-minded and irrelevant. "'The only way to help them overcome this "'was to let them take their own lives.' to make way for others who could handle the bizarre and ironic nature of the world. Let's help them all, said Franklin. Let's kill them all. Dr. Bryce, said Helena. He's right, William said. He and Franklin stood together opposite from Helena. She took her bottle and sprayed them both. That's not going to help, Franklin said. There's no point in arguing anymore. Dr. Grothman is right. We need to find all the patients and help them. Let's go. Actually... Grothman's voice bellowed. That's not exactly what I had in mind. You can't handle the truth either, can you? Franklin shook his head. It was true. Everything Dr. Grothman said was true. You're weak. You lost your telepathy, the only thing that kept you stable. But you never really were stable, were you? No, Franklin said. But you can change all that. You can cure yourself. Franklin nodded. It made so much sense. Just a little death would perk him right up. He'd never have to feel sorry again. He would be a new man. Okay, Franklin said. I'll kill myself. Thanks for your help. Don't mention it, said Grothman. I'm only doing my job. Now you let me know how that works out for you, all right? Can I help? William asked. Grothman smiled. In fact, why don't you join him? William shrugged. Sure. Sounds like fun. Franklin began to walk away with William. His mind had never been clearer. Now you, Franklin heard Grothman's voice from behind him. I'm not sure what to do with you. Franklin didn't think anything of it. All that mattered was suicide, his cure. He wondered if Tramsey was waiting for him. It would have been awfully nice for the three of them to all jump to their deaths together. 
You can't read my mind, can you? said Helena. Franklin and William reached the elevator and waited for the door to open. What are you? Dr. Grothman asked. An android? A Nick sod in disguise? Franklin heard a loud crash, and then a scream came through Grothman's speakers. Franklin glanced over his shoulder and went wide-eyed with horror. The nice man who had so kindly suggested his demise was lying on the floor in a jumbled heap of a robot suit. Helena was sitting on her knees on top of the twisted metal, hanging on to what was left of the helmet with one hand and raising the other hand above her, balled into a fist. Hello, my name is Helena. Why? Why aren't you... No. My turn to ask a question. Why would a threatnoidian trying to control a mental health facility wear a huge protective metal suit? Helena ripped Grothman's helmet off with her bare hands and threw it to the ground. Everyone! Grothman yelled. He didn't sound nearly as threatening without a sound system. Everyone listen to me. Stop trying to kill yourselves. Stop whatever it is you're doing and destroy this woman. She doesn't believe in our cause. She's evil. Franklin and William instantly left the elevator as the door finally opened for them and went to Grothman's aid. They were no match for someone who could rip apart thousand-pound metallic suits, but Dr. Grothman knew what was best for them. He was the best therapist Franklin had known. He wondered how much the bill for his suicide would be. But before he and William could reach her, Helena lifted her spray bottle and squirted Grothman in the face. The threatnoidian screamed and rubbed his eyes like a toddler who had used too much shampoo. The room was instantly in an uproar of noise and confusion. Helena climbed down from the robot suit and joined Franklin and William. Dr. Grothman's powers had worn off, and suddenly Franklin thought suicide was as stupid an idea as he would have only minutes earlier. William pushed a small red emergency button on the wall and yelled for security to put a force field around Grothman. Instantly, a wall of energy was erected around the Threpnoidian, who slowly dragged himself the rest of his way out of his robot suit with great effort. Franklin could make out several large cuts and bruises on his dark red face and his arms. Franklin couldn't help but think of Laura right then. She had been right. Franklin had no idea what she and her other personalities were capable of. He was grateful to Helena for stopping Grothman, but after today, he wasn't in a hurry to meet any of her other personalities. William reluctantly walked up to Helena and nervously held out his hand. Helena shook it. He looked both impressed and dismayed, much like Franklin felt. I don't know how you did that, but nice work, William said. Dr. Bryce, said Helena, I think you need a new copy of the Nitsu Trivis Knot. William threw his hands in the air. Seriously, man, I know Brawlnack is tough, but how could that translator confuse spray the threatnoidia with spray yourself? Good thing we weren't supposed to use hydrochloric acid or something. Franklin walked up to the force field and stared at Grothman, now bruised and battered, sitting on the ground and nursing a sprayed ankle. You're fired, Franklin said. I don't believe you work here anymore, Dr. Grothman said tauntingly. You want to know why I do the things I do? I'll tell you. We're not so entirely different. I've never used my position to murder people. Yes, okay, besides that. I am a real therapist, you know, or at least I used to be. I use my power to help people, just like you. I always knew what they thought, how they felt, and when I was done with them, they were always better for it. But like you, I couldn't use my powers when it really counted. You read the Nitsu Trivisk Knot, Remember what it says about Thripnoidian powers? Franklin didn't want to answer. He was beginning to guess where this was going. They don't work on other Thripnoidians. Exactly! Now, I never use the persuasion part on my interdimensional patients, at least not at first. Just read their minds. But then I fell in love. Got married. And a couple years later, my wife got depressed for no reason. She started seeing a therapist. But there wasn't anything he could do to make her better. There was nothing I could do either. She stopped going to work, stopped eating. She even stopped going to bars. And then Threatnoidia, you know someone's lost it when that happens. If I could have, I would have used all my power to make her happy again. She jumped off a bridge. She did it for no reason at all. And that's when I realized that anyone who needs a therapist is just delaying the inevitable. I'm the only one in our profession who really cures anyone, Dr. Bryce. And after what you've been through, you should understand. Franklin let Grothman's words ring in his ears for a moment. Then he smiled and shook his head. It's a good thing I don't buy your philosophy, he said, because you're one of those people who needs therapy. And I'm going to make sure you get it. 
Good old irony was striking once again. Here was a therapist who needed more help than all of Lactromat's patients combined. William, why don't you have a talk with Dr. Caslam to decide how to proceed with Grothman's treatment, Franklin said. But don't forget my vote. Nuclear Holocaust dimension. I got it, said William. I'm going to take Helena down to the unexplained phenomena wing and see what we can find out about her. Helena nodded, and they headed for the elevator. William took the stairs and was already gone before the elevator doors opened. Dr. Bryce, said Grothman from behind them, before you go, I want you to know one more thing. I might not have my powers now, but I was in your mind long enough to know everything I need to know about you. I'm happy for you, really, said Franklin. No, you're not. You're jealous. We are very much alike, whether you choose to realize it or not. But the real difference is that I still have my ability. And the real irony is that you've never realized the single reason all of these terrible things are happening to you. Losing your telepathy, being attacked by HR-120s, even me showing up and killing your patients. It's because of your name, Franklin Bryce. You know, the age-old constant of the multiverse. You have two first names. Franklin froze. He had been so worried about working with Helena, but he had exactly the same curse she did. It had never occurred to him in his entire life that Bryce could be a first name. He had never really met any Bryces. Grothman pushed a button on his watch, and a swirling red portal appeared above him. It sucked him and his broken robot suit into it, and then disappeared. His watch had a built-in portable aperture that went to some pocket dimension, and even if Lactromat security could trace it, he'd be in his own dimension by the time they did. And since Thrypnoidia had a powerful portal blocker, they had no way to go after him.